Lindsay Teen speaking to the issues shaping our nation. And one thing that we know full well is that leadership matters in Canada. Leadership of political parties matter. And of course, the leadership in our nation matters. And so this is one of the reasons why we have the upcoming conservative leadership race on our radar. Of course, you all will know by now, uh, Aaron O'Toole being ousted as leader first week that the Freedom Convoy was there in Ottawa. The new leadership race is on. Pierre Polyev declaring his candidacy candidacy, excuse me, right out of the gates and others now this week declaring their candidacy as well. Dr. Leslin Lewis putting her name forward once again, Jean Charest, uh, Roman Baber, and perhaps a few others still to hop in. So members of the Conservative Party will be casting their vote on September the 10th, but uh, individuals do need to have their membership up to date by as of, excuse me, June the 3rd. And so the race really is on. Those that get that membership here in the next couple months will be the ones that determine the next leader of the Conservative Party and possibly the next Prime Minister of Canada. So big things and big days. And so we're going to be chasing down different candidates to find out where they stand on various issues as a way to serve you as you engage with this important uh, moment in our national history, choosing our nation's leadership. Uh, today with me, I have Dr. Leslin Lewis. Many of you will know her from 2020 when she put her name forward and came came out of the gates pretty much as someone that very few people in the nation already knew, uh, but established herself on the national stage, getting the popular vote in the second round and eventually dropping off as uh, Erin O'Toole went up the ranks there. So she joins me today uh, to share with us about why she's putting her name forward once again and where she stands on several issues that are top of mind for Canadians and top of mind for those that care about the conservative movement in Canada. So without any further delay, let's get to it. Dr. Leslin Lewis. Well, this is a wonderful privilege. With me right now is none other than Dr. Leslin Lewis. She is Member of Parliament from Haldeman, Norfolk, in Ontario, is also a repeat offerer for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada, has three master's degrees and a PhD, a mother of two, and I could say so much more. Dr. Leslin Lewis, thank you so much for joining me today. Nice to be here, Faithine. Well, you're no stranger for those uh, who have been tracking uh, who's who in Canada over the last couple of years. Here you have emerged as one of our nation's strongest voices and leaders, and you're putting your name forward, as I just said, once again, for the Conservative Party. So for those that this might be a bit of a first meet for you, could you please uh, just give a quick background of your professional and academic uh, credentials? By way of background, I'm a lawyer. I practiced law for over two decades, had my own law firm, started Initially on Bay Street. I also taught at university, taught at law school, and also I earned a law degree and also a PhD in international law. So my experiences are multifaceted. I've also represented Canadian corporations abroad uh, who were in the area of green energy and they were selling their products abroad to uh, developing nations. And I represent represented those companies on international trade transactions. Okay. So a huge breadth of professional experience there. But I got to say this, Dr. Lewis, you know, you put your name forward in the last uh, conservative leadership race, 2020, and you were relatively unknown in terms of across the nation at that time. I, I watched you as you traveled and how Canadians just responded so positively to you and your campaign. Uh, you brought in the popular vote on the second ballot, uh, even surpassing uh, Aaron O'Toole, who ended up, uh, as we all know, uh, winning. So you felt to put your uh, you felt to put your name forward again this time what what is this what is it about for you this time and why did you feel to reoffer well a lot of the conditions that existed last time that i ran are present again i'm very concerned that we have reached a all time low in national unity and so i feel that a voice that not only unites the party but unites the country is very very important in this leadership race I'm also concerned about how we are going to navigate out of COVID. And I think someone with strong entrepreneurial experience understands what it's like to start a business and, and, and the stress that was on many of our business owners. And as you know, small businesses, small and medium-sized businesses employ over 80% of all Canadians. And they've had a really, really hard time during COVID. 
And so I think we need a leader that's going to understand that they are going to be a crucial and integral part of the solution of how we are going to rebound from COVID. Also, I'm very concerned about our environment. I feel that we have somehow thought that we can't develop our natural resources while being environmentally conscious and responsible. And that is a myth that I would like to put aside. I, 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 you've seen how with our dependence on foreign oil, what that has done, and it's put into question our um, whether or not our pipeline policies was very, very wise. I believe we had very unwise pipeline policies. We should have built the pipelines to make sure that we could get our oil to tide water and that we could offset some of the, the oil production from regimes that are totalitarian and who don't have strong environmental and human rights uh, as a part of their, their policies within their nation. I'm really also concerned about our social programs. I want to make sure that with our economy in such a, um, a, a bad position that we will be able to sustain social programs in the future for the most vulnerable, for our seniors, for those on disability, for those who, who need the government to, to be there for them because they may be struggling in some capacity. So I think we need a vibrant economy to make sure that the things that we are used to, that they are sustainable in the future. Well, all those things are uh, top of mind for most Canadians right now. Obviously, uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia uh, definitely highlighting our energy vulnerability. But I also want to talk about our economy as it pertains to the debt and deficits going into COVID-19. We were paying $80 million a day just to interest on the federal debt, as you pointed out, what, how that could go to social programs. There's such a need there for stability. Uh, how would a government that you lead edge into tackling things like inflation, uh, the debt and deficits? Well, I think that we have to start producing more than we're consuming. And for in order to do that, we have to instill confidence in our economy. We have to instill confidence in those who generate wealth, our entrepreneurs and businesses. I think that we also have to focus on meeting the needs of Canadians. The housing bubble is, is just, it's really, really causing people to be disillusioned about whether or not they will ever have that dream of owning a home. And so we have to make sure that affordable housing are built, and we also have to make sure that we have ways of, of, of getting people into the market. So policies that will incentivize people to buy homes, lowering the HST um, payable on first-time home buyers uh, for new homes, also increasing the amount that they would be able to put in from their RSP savings. Those are things that we we need to consider. Policies that will encourage. Uh, people to get into the housing market. Absolutely. Now, another thing that's top of mind for Canadians is the charter, right? <laughs> Canadian mobility rights, uh, the right to earn a living, to work. Obviously, the vaccine mandates, you know, you know, really complicating all of this. Uh, where would you and a government that you lead stand on uh, charter rights of Canadians and the vaccine mandates? Well, the Charter of Rights speaks for itself. I believe that it should be upheld. I believe in the freedoms that it offers. And I'm very concerned when those freedoms are undermined. I've always made sure that I advocate on behalf of Canadians in upholding these freedoms, such as freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. Those are things that I think are a fundamental part of our democracy. And if you tie that in with the mandates, I encourage people to um, adopt informed consent and, and speak to their doctors and do take personal responsibility. And so do everything that you need to do during the pandemic. Keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, and to minimize the stress on our healthcare systems. And for that, I, I do believe that vaccines are a part of that, but I also believe in informed consent. And for those people who are unable to be vaccinated or who have spoken to their doctors and have chosen to exercise their informed consent and not be vaccinated, 
I also believe that we can have reasonable accommodations. Uh, testing is one form of a reasonable accommodation to make sure that people are safe. And I don't believe that people should be losing their jobs because they're unable to be vaccinated. Now, the interim leader, the Honorable Candace Bergen, has been pushing Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, hard to table a plan to end uh, the mandates. And I'm thinking namely about uh, the travel ban for people who are not vaccinated without exemption. Uh, is this something that you're in support of, just seeing an end to the federal mandates as well? Well, if you look around the world, the majority of countries are moving on and they're realizing that people, we've done all that we can do. Um, double vaccinated, triple vaccinated, lockdowns, masking, social distancing, and getting through Omicron in the last, the last wave of COVID with Omicron and people recognizing that so many individuals got Omicron. And so we're getting to a stage where I believe that I trust what the healthcare professionals are saying. The medical officers of health around the country are uniform in their uh, belief that we need to move on, we need to end the mandates, we need to learn how to live with COVID. And so I do believe that it's time for the federal government to put together a plan the same way that the provinces did on how we are going to start to get back to some semblance of normalcy. All right. Well, those are a lot of topics that are top of mind for Canadians. But let's talk about some things that are top of mind for Conservatives. Conservatives want to elect a leader that can win, that can form government in the upcoming election, whenever that might be. Um, do you feel like you can win, say, for example, the urban centres? This tends to be a place where the balance of power is really fleshed out. Uh, and Quebec. Let's, let's start with the urban centres, though. Why do you feel like you have strength to uh, get that vote? Well, I didn't spend a lot of time during the last leadership race on the urban centers because I had started in rural Alberta and Saskatchewan. And by that time that I was able to get through that, COVID hit. And so we, we weren't able to campaign anymore. But I do intend to spend some more time on the urban centers. I think it's very, very important uh, that we have a comprehensive plan that includes various, all the regions of our country. But specifically on the urban centers, I think people, there's a new growth of an influx of, of, of new citizens within the urban centers. And they're coming from countries where they came here largely for the opportunity of being able to earn a living. They came here because of our democracy. And someone who can articulate these principles and is uh, someone who listens to them and understands what their needs are, I think that that is, that is um, going to go very, very far with reaching and expanding our base within the urban centers. And you yourself uh, immigrated to Canada at, at what age? Remind us again. Five years old. Okay, and so you've got personal experience in that. Let's talk about Quebec. Uh, I know big question last time around is how's her French? Is she going to be able to relate to uh, the, the province of Quebec, the Francophone Canadian community? Uh, will she be able to win their hearts? How would you respond to that? Um, well, j'étudie encore le français et j'aime apprendre le, le français. Um, je veux faire une argent, mais en cause de la COVID-19, uh, je n'ai pas pu encore. Um, les gens dans le Québec, c'est c'est très gentil, c'est uh, encouragé encouragé um, ma candidate uh, candidacy. And I, the the beauty about Quebec and the people of Quebec is that they. Um, they just love to see you try to learn French. And for them, that's enough. The Anglophones, I find, are more, they're the ones who'll say, oh, you'll never win Quebec. And then when you speak to a Francophone and they see your effort and they see your progress and they encourage you, even if your words aren't perfect, they say, continue to speak, continue to speak. And they, you could see the, the enthusiasm that they have for someone who is learning the language and 
Um, I would even say that I'm becoming a Francophile because I, I love the culture so much and you learn so much about the culture. And so I think that they're just looking for someone who genuinely cares about the region, who is willing to treat them as equals and, and look out for the policies that make this, uh, Quebec a distinct society and recognize that. And so I think that I will be accepted there and I intend to spend quite a bit of my time there. Beautiful. So I need to edge into the, the question of Indigenous issues. You know, we have communities all across our nation right now, First Nations communities that still don't have clean water, some of them, uh, you know, very close to, to your own personal home. Um, how would you approach the, the need to bring truth and reconciliation, that ongoing process there, clean drinking water to our communities or anything else that's on your radar for our, our Indigenous uh, fellow Canadians? Well, I think that a part of our plan has to be reconciliation. We've been dealing with this issue for so long. We, I think the Indigenous communities are frustrated that we're not moving forward. And it just seems like we just continue to talk and talk and virtue signal. And we have the capacity to help foreign countries, um, have communities to provide clean water to their citizens but yet we're not doing something as simple as that here. I think that that's a first step, that we need to take that first step and say, okay, this, is, this will symbolize at least some level of sincerity in getting to a point of reconciliation. And I think it's also important that we have to look at uh, certain issues that are specific to that community, such as the sex trafficking that's happening with Indigenous girls. We have to put resources into making sure that we can reduce and, and, and eliminate that disparity in, in sex trafficking that's occurring at, with Indigenous girls and the missing and murdered Aboriginal uh, women. These are things that have all been documented and been in position papers, but yet nothing has been done about it. And I think it's time that we start um, acting and, and not just uh, speaking about what the issues are. Absolutely. And as you're speaking, I'm reminded actually of uh, Arnold Viersen's very good work on uh, protecting youth from being exposed to violently explicit pornographic images. Is, is that something you would like to see continue to move down the line as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's very important that um, even in th this new Bill C-11 that's, that's coming out, that is regulating the internet. We can regulate users. We want to regulate what uh, algorithms and, and what, what shows up um, when people do searches on the internet. And we can find these things, but we can't find uh, MindGeek and, and find these companies that uh, are engaging in exploitation of, of young girls. So I think that we need to put resources into that and we have the capacity to address uh, these crimes against against young women. Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> I need to continue in the vein with what conservatives are concerned about. You know, one of the things that a lot of people were concerned about with the, with the last uh, leader was how he moved away from the base on some, some critical issues. You would see things voted on at the convention, passed by the majority of the base, and then the leader go a completely different direction. It really, really uh, discouraged some people. So when it comes to, uh, you know, reflecting the base, uh, I'm just wondering where your position would be on that. And also, if you would uh, follow in, in the footsteps of previous prime ministers who always allowed a free vote on issues of conscience or previous leaders of the party. So um, what about those two things? Well, yeah, I think it's very important that issues of conscience have to be free votes. And um, I think that that's a cornerstone of, of what our con that's in our constitution. Also, the respecting of the basis is very, very important. Um, on an issue like the carbon tax was something that was very, very important to the base and very important to large segments of uh, the conservative base, farmers, um, the average Canadian who would bear the burden of, of the carbon tax when they 
complete their home when they get in their cars. And it, it, it was agreed on that the average struggling Canadian should not bear the lion's share of the cost of the environment. And so that was a fundamental principle that I don't believe that we should have gone back on. Now, in your last uh, leadership bid campaign, uh, you actually put forward four pro-life policies that you said you're right there on CTV with Evan Solomon. You're saying these are the things that I'm willing to uh, edge into and stand for. Um, do you plan on picking up those same pro-life policies again? And if so, uh, could you just quickly rattle them off for our viewers right now? Sure, Faithine. As you know, I am pro-life. And I believe in the sanctity of life and that life begins at conception. And that is, that is my belief. I also have a lot of people around me and friends who are pro-choice. And so I've had many conversations about what is it that we believe together? What, what, what issues do we agree on? And so there are a number of issues that I believe the majority of women in this country and the majority of people in general agree on. And so what I've done is I've formulated my pro-life policies around those issues. And there are things just such as um, sex-selective abortion, which I, I believe that a woman, a, a, a female should not be targeted in the womb. And so that is, many feminists believe that in order to fight misogyny, we do have to start in the womb. And if we have a society that allows um, abortion just because the baby is a girl, that that is not a good policy. And so the majority of Canadians, I think it's about 78% of Canadians believe that it's wrong for abortions to be solely on, on based on the sex of the baby. Uh, another issue is uh, just issues around euthanasia. Um, I've spoken about those and conscience rights issues before. Um, also, pregnancy care centers. The majority of Canadians believe that when a woman or a girl has an unplanned pregnancy and she's in need of help, that pregnancy care centers are something good to offer in society. And so the majority of Canadians do believe in that. So those are some of the um, issues that I believe that there is a meeting of the minds on and that we can have conversations about. And those are uh, examples of pro-life issues that um, I'm concerned about and that the majority of Canadians agree with. Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. So thank you for your courage, your compassion and your common sense. That was your motto last time around. So good for you. Okay, we've talked about the economy, we've talked about Indigenous issues, obviously we're just lighting on, on things quickly, we've talked about the environment. Uh, let's talk about conscience as it relates to Canadians. You know, parents are concerned about uh, conscience rights. I know you talked about this in the context of the, the vaccine mandate, but we're also dealing with physicians, uh, Kelly Block's bill on protecting physician conscience as it pertains to medical assistance in dying. Uh, clergy conscience rights has been something that has really come up, particularly last fall. Uh, is this something you would continue to champion, uh, the rights of Canadians just to conduct their lives within the bounds of their conscience? I think it's very, very important. And, and that is something that's, that's also entrenched in, in the Charter. I think that governments should not be imposing values tests on organizations and, and individuals and not imposing their values on, on individuals. For example, parents have the right to raise their children in accordance with their values. A doctor uh, should not have to go against their conscience on things such as life issues. It, it, I, these are fundamental freedoms that I believe that are entrenched in our charter. Okay, so we are starting to close in here. I know on, on your allotted time for me today. Thank you so much for your generosity. But before we just begin to close, I'd like to wrap by letting people know how they can find you, get involved in supporting your leadership bid if they feel led to do that. But Dr. Leslin Lewis, why are you the one to lead the Conservative Party and our nation forward at this time? How would you respond to that? Well, I think it's important that the next leader finds a way to unite the party and also unite the country. 
I have seen just a complete erosion of our fundamental freedoms, seeing Canadians being pitted against each other, demonization, policies based upon fear. And I think Canadians want to move beyond that. They want to focus on things that will unite us and will prosper us as a nation. And so we need to go back to the basics, to the environment, to, to, to the economy, and making sure that our social uh, system is in place and that we have programs that, that will uplift and, um, and encourage us to, to move on beyond um, some of the, uh, the damage that COVID has caused. I, I feel that we need to focus on being a more self-sufficient country and making sure that we are prepared for the next pandemic and that we're not caught off guard again. So essentially, we need to get our financial, our environmental, and, and our economic house in order. And I believe that my life experience, I'm the best person to do that. Well, there's no doubt that you have a massive depth of uh, personal and professional experience uh, pre-politics, and I know a lot of Canadians will, will indeed appreciate that. So so you just announced this week, uh, we're doing this interview just a few days after your initial announcement. I'm so honored that you would take time to do this with me. Um, but where do people find you? Are you going to be hitting the road? Are you going to be doing online gatherings? How do they find you, and how do they hear more about where you stand on various positions? All of the above. We will be doing tours um, going around the country. We'll be meeting with EDAs, um, that's electoral district associations. We will be having small meetings and gatherings. But if you want to stay in touch with us, the best place to go is the website, leslinlewis.ca. And we will try to keep that as up to date as possible. It's also very important that if you want to vote, that you take out a membership and a membership to the Conservative Party will enable you to vote for your the, the next leader. And so we encourage you to do that. And that's very, very important at this time. Okay, and each person that's putting forward their name, I believe we've got four individuals so far that have officially announced or are close to announcing, uh, needs to uh, give $300,000, needs to have a certain amount of signatures. Uh, what are the thresholds and where are you at on that right now? And how can people uh, participate in helping you get over the humps that you need to? Well, the most important thing right now is to get those 500 signatures. We also have a donation link on our website that you can donate to uh, my campaign. But to get the 500 signatures of the members is something that we need to get in with the application. And so that form is also on the website. Wonderful. Dr. Leslin Lewis, uh, I know many Canadians are very grateful that you have reoffered for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Uh, it's going to be an interesting run here, interesting debates, I'm sure, between yourself and the other candidates. Deeply appreciate you taking some time today for us to hear your heart afresh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation with none other than Dr. Leslin Lewis, could be the next leader of the Conservative Party of Canada and could also be the next Prime Minister of Canada. I hope you appreciated the content. Please like and share our channel if you're watching this on YouTube, on Facebook, or any other of our platforms. And do stay connected with us because we are going to be chasing down some of the other candidates or all of the other candidates as well to find out where they stand on some of these very important issues that we discussed with Dr. Lewis today, and we're going to be putting together a voter's guide, crunching it all out, giving everybody uh, a score from our perspective on the various issues that are critical to the future of our nation. So you're going to want to track with us at formycanada.ca. Uh, you can sign up there for our email list. You can sign up there actually to get your membership in the Conservative Party so that you can be a voice at this critical time and also stay connected with us to get that insider information and the voter's guide. Thanks again for joining me. Hope to see you next time.